don't need a high-end designer or a lot of money to get a luxe look. Be your own interior designer. This is Affordable Interior Design, the podcast. Here's your host, Betsy Hellman. Hi there. It is great to be back with you for yet another week. I'm extra excited this week because I'm joined by a special guest. It's someone that some of you avid podcast listeners may already know, but I'm going to let her introduce herself without further ado. Welcome to the show, Ingrid. Hello. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I always love being a guest on a podcast. So thank you for inviting me. I'm I'm super excited. Well, of course. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your podcast that I said a lot of my listeners may or may not already know. Yes. So Leslie and I run the Declutter Hub podcast. And we actually can't believe it that we are now 230 episodes in and counting. And which start we, we kind of started as we don't really like writing yet, but we love talking. Let's start a podcast. And that was kind of like five years ago. (laughs) And we still, you know, enjoy, you know, recording a weekly podcast. And we have listeners all over the world and we totally adore it. So I am one of two. I'm one half of the Declutter Hub. And Leslie and I run an online membership to help people declutter and organize their homes. Because lots of people know that can do it themselves. They're absolutely fine. Some people know you can actually hire somebody to help you, a professional organizer, but a lot of people are sometimes very embarrassed to let somebody in their homes. And that's why we set up the online membership. Also because Leslie and I are both in the UK and we got inquiries from people, but I'm in America or I'm in, uh, I'm in Amsterdam or I'm in the other part of the UK. I want to, you to help me. And we said, There is a need out there for people to have more resources available. And we kind of started very, kind of very small and it's kind of snowballed into an amazing podcast, a Facebook group and indeed an online membership. And we now help hundreds and hundreds of people all over the world with their clutter. And we are just, you know, absolutely delighted. And we love, we both still love it. (laughs) Well, what personally got you into decluttering? What was sort of that germ of an idea or passion? Where did that come from? I think I, my friend always makes a joke and says, I think you were were organized from the day you were born, Ingrid. And I think I come from quite an organized family, but it never felt forced or just you have to do it like this. It was just, we were just an organized family. My mom was very organized. My father was very organized. And I actually trained as a hotelier. I'm actually, a, a, I did hotel management school. I specialized in hotel cleaning. And that was my first, my path where I started on. And then I kind of became a facilities manager for a Dutch lettings agency. So I showed people around lots of houses. And I saw, of course, lots of clutter as well. And then uh, my children were born and I was like, can I go back into the hotel business? Like my my partner, my husband still is working in hotels. But I thought, can I really do that when I've got small children? And I was talking to my friends and I said, where do you see me going next? I just don't know what to do. And they were like, Ingrid, you're so organized. You have to tell other people how to get organized. And I just went don't be crazy that's that such a job doesn't exist and they were like i'm sure people could do with your expertise your help you're just a very organized person and i googled professional organizer or help other people get organized in their homes and this whole kind of world opened for me and that was 13 years ago when professional organizing especially here in the uk wasn't the big thing yet And I've seen it just change over the last 13 years dramatically. When I started, I think there was 40, 50 professional organizers here in the UK. And I actually went into people's houses and helped them declutter. And I still do. I still have my business here in Southeast London. I have a team that helps me because, of course, now I spread to myself over the two businesses, my own business and, of course, the business with Leslie, the Declutter Hub. 
Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, you know, I had this whole other vision that maybe you would get into decluttering because you came from a cluttered family or something, but it's just in your DNA, it sounds like. It, it, there are different kinds of professional organizers. Some people have got, like you said, F R have got it in their DNA. It's just inherent to them. They, For them, it makes complete sense that I'm one of these people. Um, but we also have professional organizers that come from cl very cluttered backgrounds and go, never again, when I set up for myself, I'm going to live in a, in a tidy house when I'm right. out of this cluttered house and then see the benefit of helping other people that have struggled with lots of clutter as well. So very, very different backgrounds, but all with the same vision of we need to help people because clutter can be absolutely debilitating and yeah. take up so much energy and effort and and headspace and oh i love helping people it's just still my 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 it's my passion and the changes that we as professional organizers can create in people's lives and i also want to do a shout out to all my fellow professional organizers in in the us in canada in brazil i mean all over the world there are professional organizers and i i know many many organizers in the us as well and i absolutely um just want to give them a little shout out as well <laughs> Well, yes, it is definitely a booming profession over here as well. And, you know, as an interior designer, I'm in the business of helping people get more things, new things. But sometimes I walk into a space and I say, you know, we can't bring in anything else until we get rid of these items. But it really isn't my specialty. Mm -hmm. I love an organized space. I'm drawn to it, but I'm also kind of a creative type. And sometimes the more creative you are, the more prone you can be to messiness or disorganization. So everything in my space has a place, but it doesn't always live there. Mm -hmm. And in my past, um, college, before college, I was a little bit of a hoarder. I loved collecting beautiful things. And I didn't now, when I collect beautiful things, I can buy them for my clients, right? I see something beautiful, I can buy it, I can have it, but I can give it to them. Whereas before I didn't have that outlet, so I would buy it and keep it and it would just accumulate. So tell me, you know, it can be so overwhelming for those of us who don't have it in our DNA. Yeah. How do you approach a decluttering project? Excellent question. And, um, we have in leslie and i have developed an eight-step process called the cycle of success and we see decluttering as something that you don't do once it's something that you will have to do time and time again decluttering and organizing is never finished and i'm sorry to bring this news to your listeners but you can make it easier and better for yourself as long as you keep buying stuff to come into your house you're going to have to spend time tidying it, organizing it, decluttering it, cleaning it, and all of those things. So, of course, the less that comes into your house, the easier it gets to manage these things. But it's a process. And within that process, you have projects that you do. And what's very important when you're just starting out with decluttering and organizing is to start small. So don't go, okay, this weekend I've got the Saturday off. I'm going to tackle that room. And I'm going to go for it because you have bitten off more than you can chew. And then what happens that you is that halfway through the pro to the project, you look around and you go, oh, my gosh, it's worse than it was before. And you get into a bit of a panic and then you kind of walk away and get sidetracked and think I'm going to have a cup of tea now first. And then it's really hard to come back. So it's really important to make it a small project. Start with a drawer, start with a shelf, start with a cupboard. And with, when you do that, you need to have a process. And that's what we call the cycle of success. It has eight steps. And I would love to talk you through those eight steps and give you a little bit of an explanation about how that works. I would love that. Yes, let's hear it. Brilliant. So the first step in the cycle of success is you need to plan. When are you going to do this? You know, if you know that you're going out in half an hour to see a friend or go for lunch or go for a meal or go to the gym, you can't start a project, you know, unless you do just the tiniest drawer that you have in your house. You need to plan this. 
over the weekend, when am I going to do this? When have I got a little bit of time to actually focus on this? Have I got a couple of bin bags ready to put stuff in for recycling and for rubbish and to maybe give a back something back to my friends? Have I got a book, couple of boxes that I can put stuff in that need to go to another part of my house because it's in the wrong room? Can I turn off my phone and my 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 socials just for a little while so I'm not getting distracted so you can actually focus? So step number one, plan. Mm -hmm. Then step number two, start. Just get started. And honestly, that sounds really easy, but the getting started part is sometimes really, really hard. And that's where the breaking the project down into smaller mm -hmm. manageable chunks is really super important. Then you're going to ask yourself some questions. Do I need it? Do I love it? Do I use it? Those are the kind of basic first decluttering questions. If you're like, oh, yeah, I kind of love it, but I'm not sure and I kind of need it. But no, no, no. if you kind of start to kind of think like that, you have to start asking yourself deeper questions. When was the last time I've used this? Is it going to be the thing that I always grab first? Or have I got five other options that I would pick over this one? Right. For example, in clothing, what we see sometimes is that people have 18 pairs of jeans or 44 pairs of jeans. You're never going to wear four, pair number 44. You're going to go, oh, that's my favorite pair of jeans. And those are the ones that I like and I fit. So those are the things you need to keep. Yeah. So decide as well what's important to enough to stay in your house instead of what am I going to declutter? What's important enough to stay? That what really, if you really helps. love it, but mm. you don't need it or use it. Exactly. I have a lot of those. Yes, and that's fine because you need to find a home for those. But let me come back to that in oh, a minute. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes. So that's really important. Another question can you can ask yourself: Have I got something similar that I really love and use, and can I let this one go? So it's all about asking yourself questions. Then you're going to sort. You're going to, for an example, when you're doing your wardrobe, you're going to put your shirts together and your trousers together and your jackets together and your T-shirts together. So you can start to kind of see like, oh, how, where have I got a lot of? And actually, so those are probably the piles that need to be thinned out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Same in a kitchen. Start putting your pans together and your and your plastic containers and your mugs and your glasses, because then you can start to think about how many have I got? A lot of times with clutter stuff is in different places. And then if you ask yourself, do I need it? Yes, because it's the only one I have, but then you've completely forgotten. You've got six others in different cupboards. So you need to start kind of sorting things together, like with like in the same categories. If you find something here, so for example, if you're already finding like, oh, I've got lots of nice stuff that I want to declutter, I don't need it. And you find you have a full bag and you're working in quite a small space, take that bag out to the rubbish or put it into the recycling so you can still have room to move. Don't mm. try to climb over bags if you're working on stuff. It's very important. Then you're going to go, okay, where am I going to store this? But for example, if you work in a kitchen, where am I going to put my glasses? Where are my pots and pans going to go? Where, um, if you're doing a, a wardrobe, how are my hangers? Have I got enough hangers? Are they all falling apart and are they cracked? Or do I maybe need to order some hangers? Do I need to get an, another box to put something in? So start to think about that. Don't order it all just yet, but you need to kind of know what you're working with. Then you're going to put it away. And you're going to move it next step in the cycle of success. For example, in a kitchen, pots and pans are heavy. Do you want to put them low in the low cupboards? You mm -hmm. don't want to put those high up and have to lift them because they're heavy. So glasses and mugs and Tupperware and plastic containers are lighter. So they can go in top cupboards and heavier mm -hmm. things like um, pots and pans, plates, uh, things with a plug like toasters and things like that and rice cookers and toasty makers they can go in lower cupboards so you need to think about the logic and where would i look for it 
and also the accessibility. Some, if you've got really, really high cupboards, something that you very infrequently use needs to go higher up or more in the corner. You, the, the prime real estate is the areas that you can easily see and the things that you can easily go into. So you need to think about that. Same with when you do a wardrobe. When you open your, your wardrobe, you need to be able to see the things that you love to wear all the time. You're not going to put a dress that you had on for a super special occasion in the middle of your wardrobe because that's probably something that's sentimental or it's something that you very, very infrequently wear. Mm -hmm. So you want to put that somewhere where you don't see it all the time. You want to put right. stuff that you use all the time visible. Then it's time to finish the project. And this is where a lot of people got to go. They We put stuff back in my cupboards. I'm done now. And it's like, you have to finish the project. This is when you put your, your plastic recycling in your bins. This is when you throw away your rubbish. This is when you put your bags for Goodwill or the charity or the donation uh are the Salvation Army in your in your car and you drive there. You don't yeah. put it in a cupboard somewhere right. <laughs> or in a hallway. You need to finish the project. Because it's that last 20% for me. Like it I'll is. get really young ho then everything's looking so nice as I have it organized. And then there's still this pile yes. of things that I haven't dealt with or that I haven't given myself enough time. I haven't blocked out time to actually drive there. So yes. I do put it in the hallway or right by the door and then it sits there for the next two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I see it. I know. And, and so it's important. Why? I'll tell you why. Because you need to be able to enjoy the fruits of your labor. And that's the last step in our cycle of success. You need to be able to give yourself a pat on the back and go, I did this. This is fantastic. It feels finished. And when that bag is still in your hallway, it, you can't almost mentally not take it off in your head to go, I finished this job. That's right. And enjoying something, your hard work is so important. And you can use this cycle. And that's the nice thing about the cycle of success. However big or small your project is, you can use the same system. You just start at the beginning and you go, okay, I'm doing the next drawer now. Let me go back to the cycle of success. And I'm going to plan how I'm going to do this. I'm going to go through the steps and, and enjoy. Because the thing is, if you enjoy finishing something, you are motivated to do it again. Right. And when you see that you did actually complete it, because sometimes yeah. for me, it feels like a never ending process if you don't take that time to enjoy the finale. So how do you personally enjoy a finale, whether it's working on a client project or whether it's instructing one of the people in your membership? What do you tell them to do to kind of celebrate that? You can do loads of things. Of course, the thing we're going to not say is buy more stuff because when you're happy, <laughs> because that will be counterintuitive. But there are so many things you can do. Give yourself permission to read a book, go for a walk, have a coffee with your friends, um, just lounge on your sofa for a couple of hours and watch your favorite series. Make yourself a nice bath and use up one of the, the, the lovely bath lotions that you found when you're decluttering your bathroom mm -hmm. and all the nice things you've kept for, ooh, for, for, for nice. I'm, I'm going to only use that for, for when it's like the right time. It's like, well, the time is now. You know, you live now. If we only keep things for best, it's called keeping things for best. You know, for example, I see beautiful towels in linen cupboards. Mm. And I'm like, Oh, these are nice. And then I see a whole stack of towels that are a bit, they have, you know, a bit ratty and tatty and I've got all these things on them. And I'm like, what are those? Oh, those are the towels that I use all the time. And then I'm like, what are those other ones? They're the ones that I keep for best. And I'm like, when is that? And they're like, um, and I'm like, exactly. Your best life is now because you never know what's going to happen, you know? Right, and right. I would love for you to, to use up all these beautiful things that you spend money on and that you've invested in and give yourself as well. You know, we always want to do so well for other people. 
we right. always think of other like people first and not ourselves. The guests or saving those towels or that lotion for the guests when they come over or it's so true. Yeah. 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 And it's the same in a house as well. Um, and you probably see that as well is that some houses have like spare bedrooms that never get used, but then they are working from the kitchen table or on the, from a tray on their, the, on their sofa. And you're like, what are you doing? Well, this is my home office. And it's like, Oh, it's like, You've, you've got a room. No, but that's the spare room. And I'm like, how often have you got guests? Oh, well, maybe two, three nights a year. And I'm like, right. you're actually giving up a whole room for somebody for like two nights a year. And you're trying to kind of camp out in your kitchen and living room when you're trying to actually run a full-time job. It makes exactly. no sense. No, it's so funny because we have a small room in our house. The smallest room I made the guest room. And when our guests come, which are primarily the grandmothers, they're kind of offended that they're in this smallest room. Yeah. But I say, you know, you only come four times a year, three times a year, and the rest of the time we're living in these other rooms. So yeah. I understand you don't want to offend guests. You don't want to make them feel bad. But at the same time, you want to be allocating your space based on how much you're actually using it. Absolutely. And I could not agree more. Now, I would love to go back to your question about Ingrid, but there are things that I love, but I don't use oh, them and I don't need them. Lots of times these are sentimental items. Yes. Please keep them, but you don't have to keep them all. Oh. I am so much a firm believer that a house, you know, becomes a home when you've got beautiful, you know, when you've got things on display that mean something to you. Now, some things you might not want to have on display. You might want to create a beautiful sentimental box with sentimental items for you and just have out some nice things, but definitely go for quality over quantity. You mm -hmm. know, if you've got 20 of the same thing, can you pick out a couple instead of keeping them all? And we see that a lot when people need to either downsize from a larger house to a smaller house, mm -hmm. or of course, when parents or loved ones pass away right. and a house has to be sorted through and people end up with boxes and boxes and boxes. But if there's so much, you can't see anything at all anymore. So right. it's really about picking out those favorite items that really mean something. And it's really important to ask yourself the question, whose memory is it? Is it your memory or was it your parents' memory? And why are you keeping it? I think that's really an important question because uh, I design in a lot of small spaces yeah. and a lot of spaces... Um, because I'm in an urban area near New York City. Mm -hmm. And so space is at a premium. And a lot of my clients have inherited these pieces yeah. from grandma, from mom and dad, and they feel a strong connection. And I think sometimes they get confused as to whose memory it is, right? And that's yeah. a really cool question to be asking and reflecting upon. Because yeah. sometimes they feel like out of obligation, they need to keep the item. Yeah. How do you handle that? Because it's such a tricky territory. Very much. So it's very important. It has a lot to do with guilt, mm. right? So it also has a lot. Guilt comes in many different guises in, with clutter. It can be guilt because somebody is giving you something and you mm. feel bad to let it go. It can be guilt because you spend money on it. And yeah. later you think, what did I do? This was like, this was not good. But you don't want to let it go because it was so expensive. So we yeah. see that a lot. And I think... Um, what's really important is to really think about what are the key pieces and does this fit with my lifestyle? Does it fit with my life? And do I do the item justice by keeping it and putting it away in a cupboard somewhere or actually by freeing it up and letting it go out into the world? It can have more lives than just sitting here in my cupboards. Mm -hmm. So I think taking a look at yourself and going instead of trying to look at the past all the time and have all the stuff from the past nearly hold you hostage and have all these storage units that oh, eat yeah. up so much money hold you ransom nearly to go where am i what do i need in my current life and where am i going and is my stuff and my house is that currently serving me 
to where I want, where I want to be. And that goes for clothes that goes for, you know, aspirational items. We find lots of snazzy kitchen items in kitchens and yeah. And then the, yeah, I've made ice cream once or yeah, I bought a pasta maker because I saw it on a, on a, on a commercial somewhere. It looks so cool. I've done it once, but now the kitchens are so cluttered. They can't even prepare a normal dinner anymore. So you right. have to be really honest with yourself and go, wow, how, how am I going to do this? How am I going to go through this and, and make those decisions? And that's why we do sentimental items later. You start with yeah. easier items. Very, very important. When we think about clutter, we think about the worst room in our house. The yeah. spare bedroom that's full of stuff that's been dumped there. The, the, the basement. The, the basement that's chock-a-block. And so we think, oh, we need to do that. But what you need to do, if you haven't decluttered in a long time, you need to build up your decluttering muscle. Mm. And you need to build up that decision-making muscle to kind of go, okay, I feel good about this. And you need to start with easier items. Normally, kitchens and bathrooms and linen cupboards are easier to kind of get going yeah but, but if you know you're like uh, okay Ingrid clothes I can do but don't touch the shoes leave the shoes until later you know everybody's got their thing everybody's right. got their thing right no I think that's a good idea to build up that muscle because we do think let me tackle the biggest thing first let me tackle the thing I'm most afraid of just to get it out of the way then everything else will be easier yeah but I do think there's something to that muscle and you know being trained to make those decisions and maybe even letting some things go and re remembering that you didn't regret it right like look at all I cleaned out and I don't miss those things at all yeah maybe I am ready for the basement maybe yeah. I am ready so that's a really good reframing yeah. Well, you are a wealth of information, Ingrid. I'm sure you share this and so much more on your podcast. Tell people where they can find you and Leslie. Yes, uh, we have the Declutter Hub podcast and you can find us on um, Apple, Apple podcast, on uh, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, all the podcast players. You can go to declutterhub.com and listen in there or go to our YouTube channel and you can watch and listen at the same time. And yeah, we absolutely adore it. And we do a different topic every week. And sometimes we, we have guests as well. And sometimes we do a 10 things that podcast, which is very, very popular. Um, yeah, we, we just talk about random things. And I think that's sometimes what happens when people listen to the podcast. They're like, they love it, but they're like, it jumps from one thing to the next. And it does. And that's why people end up coming into the membership because we say, okay, I want a structured journey. I want you to take me by the hand and, and walk me through my house and how I need to do it. And I want to ask you questions, Ingrid, and I want to be motivated and supported by you. And that's why people kind of transition from the podcast. But a lot of our members still listen in week in, week out, because we always try to make it fun as well, because decluttering can be hard enough already as yes. it is. <laughs> Put on some fun music, have Ingrid and Leslie on in the background and dig into the small stuff first. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, it's been such a pleasure to learn and be inspired to declutter. Thank you so much for having me, Betsy. It's been absolutely wonderful. And honestly, if any of your listeners have questions, please go to declutterhub.com and have a look and reach out. We're more than happy to help and chat. And um, yeah, it's been great being here. Thank you. Of course, of course. Well, guys, you know where to go. Uh, check them out. You won't be disappointed. And I know that you guys are always excited for new podcasts. And we'll be right back with you next week. Until then, bye. A big thank you to Aton and the Embassy who wrote our theme song. A shout out to Catherine Heller who owns the podcast shop and is our editor extraordinaire. We also want to thank Ginny Sunnison and her team at the Savvy Podcast Agency for their help with our social, our YouTube channel, and so much more. We also want to thank Uploft, which is our parent company who supports this podcast. And lastly, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to you. Thank you so much for tuning in and for all your support.